Okay, welcome to lecture for Psych 350. We'll be talking about the humanistic uh, approach to understanding personality. And again, like some of the other approaches we've talked about, there's not a particular humanistic theory. There are humanistic theories which together make up the, the humanistic approach. Uh, so to begin, to talk a little bit about the, the background uh, of the humanistic approach. Uh, in many ways, it was a reaction, its development was a reaction to the psychodynamic and behaviorist approaches that were very popular during the, the 1950s whenever the humanist approach uh, was uh, fomenting and, and about to, to be born uh, between the 50s and the, uh, the 60s. Um, and it was born because people were uncomfortable with uh, the kind of the deterministic, pessimistic view of humanity that um, uh, kind of Freudian and neo freudian uh, theorists took and also the, the behaviorists, you know, Watson and Skinner, um, think that, that whatever we do is merely uh, a balance of responses to certain stimuli. You know, what we're going to do, do can be entirely predicted based on rewards and punishments. And some people just felt like, you know, that doesn't explain me, and that doesn't, that may explain dogs and rats, but it doesn't apply to humans, uh, and that we're somehow uh, different uh, and special. Uh, so in many ways, uh, a reaction uh, to those uh, approaches to understanding personality. Uh, and it grew out of uh, uh, two schools of thought in terms of philosophy, one being existentialism, <coughs> existentialism uh, people like Soren Kierkegaard, uh, which the existentialists uh, were into uh, examining the meaning of human experience, you know, and many of them looking at the purpose of life, why are we here, kind of questions. And that can kind of be seen, that flavor of that can definitely be seen in, in a lot of the humanist theories. Uh, and then also the other school of thought from philosophy uh, that influenced uh, the humanistic uh, approach to personality would be phenomenology people like uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and uh, Edmund Husserl, uh, and these people who are attempting to understand and describe the present experiences of an individual, so the phenomenon uh, around them and all the things that people are aware of and that are going on in their uh, awareness. And, and, and many of the phenomenologists uh, were using uh, mathematics uh, to do this, which is uh, kind of interesting basis for, for a psychological theory. Uh, so, out of uh, these schools of thought, of, of philosophy, and in reaction to uh, the prevailing ways of viewing humanity, uh, came this, this third force, right, the humanistic psychology. Uh, and although, like I said before, there's not one single unified humanistic theory, uh, the theories in general shared some common uh, tenets and common uh, foci. Uh, one of which uh, is this idea of uh, personal growth, that, that humans are geared design, and if you want to use a biological map onto this, we're, uh, our DNA, it's in our DNA, right? that's what biologically we're wired somehow, uh, to grow. Um, the assumption is that there's some potential self right, that you always move toward, uh, but like kind of an infinite horizon, you can never reach it, but you'll always move uh, toward it, and, and this true self, from a humanist point of view, has a, a you know, positive con connotation. You, know, you don't talk about realizing your full evilness. There's an, an assumption there that people are basically good and that you'll realize your full potential goodness and creativity and all these kind of positive attributes. Uh, some people might even argue that uh, one way of thinking about this uh, is growth towards some uh, divine model. Uh, for those of you familiar with the uh, uh, Christian traditions, uh, becoming more Christ-like, that there's always a movement toward that. You can never be that, this ideal you can move toward that. That's one way of looking at it. But look, from a humanist perspective, uh, it's not just about being a better person in terms of uh, these are good qualities, but becoming more truly yourself and your potential, which is unique. Uh, another uh, key aspect of humanistic theories would be this idea of personal responsibility. That um, although multiple things influence what you want to do, Right, we have these multiple competing motivations. Uh, and you can talk about uh, uh, id impulses, and you can talk about rewards and punishments, you can talk about physical limitations. But the, the focus for the humanist was, look, regardless of all these motivations, and usually competing motivations, ultimately, you choose what you do. Right? Even if, you know, they wouldn't even take the extreme of, if somebody had a gun to your head and they said, you know, uh, you're going to rob this bank or I'm going to shoot you. For the humanists, you choose to rob the bank or not. 
So, well, you, it's no choice. They're going to kill you. Yeah, they will kill you, but it is still your choice. Right? And if you, as long as you take responsibility for your choice, that's kind of the ultimate thing. Uh, it's not what choice you make that you take responsibility for. And to accept that uh, you know your behavior isn't determined by unconscious, uh, fully determined uh, by unconscious desires or by rewards and punishments, but by free will, your own choice. Um, related to that, this idea of uh, emphasis, the importance of the here and now, uh, really two things with this. One, that happiness comes from living in the moment. Okay, so that's one aspect of the importance of the here and now. Uh, living in the here and now for today, and not living for some future better life. Living, appreciating the things that are now uh, is going to lead you to happiness. And the other thing is that your antecedents, your past, doesn't don't determine your future. Okay, so, uh, a corollary of that is you don't need to understand or explore your past to have a better right now, which is really the uh, opposite of uh, psychoanalysis. Right? Psychoanalysis is all about digging into the unconscious and these past events, uh, trace back to your childhood to figure out what was wrong to free up your energy so you can be happier now. From a humanist perspective. Yeah, how you are now was influenced by maybe childhood things and, and whatnot. But whatever happened then doesn't matter in terms of what you're going to do now. As, as long as you can go to the perfect funny, you choose to be how you want to be. You know, understand where you came from, sure, but you can choose to be happy, you can choose to be sad, you can choose to be with people, you can choose to be alone. Uh, so very much an emphasis on uh, the present tense, not the past and, and not the future. And then the last kind of uh, main idea here is uh, the idea of the phenomenology of the individual, which is based on um, the idea that each individual has a unique phenomenological field. Right? So a unique set of experiences that is knowable fully only to him or herself. Right? So everything that you know and experience, and not, and not just know at a cognitive level, but on all levels of awareness you know, that you encounter, you have a unique perspective on that. You experience it your way. And I can't experience it the same exactly. And so two individuals can share uh, environmental stimuli and have different phenomenological fields. So two people uh, see a dog. They see the same exact dog. Maybe the same distance from it. For one, they see a dog and, it, and they have fear uh, and they run from it. The other one says, oh, what a cute dog, and they go pet it. Right? Very two different experiences of the same uh, stimuli. So it's part of the idea of the phenomenology of the individual that each individual's experience is unique despite any uh, commonalities uh, in the environment. The experience of it is still unique to the individual. Okay, so now let's move on to uh, the, some of the big thinkers in, in humans. And there, there are many, and we don't uh, give them all their full due here. We don't have uh, time. People like uh, Rollo May uh, are left out. Um, but uh, we'll talk about two, really. Carl Rogers and, and Abraham Maslow, and then one more, more modern one uh, after that. Uh, but for Rogers, uh, which is uh, who's arguably uh, the big one for humanists, uh, there were a couple of ideas that were really important. One, this idea of the fully functioning person. And so, um, and this goes back to the, the uh, idea of personal growth. Right? So we're always growing to become a more fully functioning person. But again, uh, from this perspective, from this perspective, even achieving, becoming, you, know, you, you are a fully functioning person. Right? That's not a destination. That's not a, 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 a static state. It's a process. It's dynamic. Right? So once you, uh, you know, if you have optimal development, if things go well for you, you'll become a fully functioning person. But when you're a fully functioning person, you're not done. That just means you've started engaging these other processes which uh, uh, Rogers felt were, were optimal. So these are things you would might maybe want to strive for and that there was an inherent tendency uh, to move toward. So uh, if you achieved this process, if you got to this point where you could do these things and you were a fully functioning person, there's a couple of characteristics associated with that. One, uh, associated with greater freedom of choice, right, which is related to that acceptance of personal responsibility. Because once you take uh, responsibility for your actions, you're free to choose. If it's not your responsibility, then you can't choose. Well, I have to do this. Society says I have to do this. Oh, I have this family obligation. They need me to do this. I must do this. I ought to do this. I should do this. 
there's no freedom there, right? You're trapped by these multiple chains of expectations and, and culture and whatnot. But for, for Rogers, if you become a fully functioning person, then you uh, continually uh, engender greater freedom of choice. Not that you wouldn't meet family obligations, but you would do so because you wanted to, not because you had to. Uh, so uh, a greater freedom of choice and increasing focus on living for the moment. So then there's that, that here and now. So people who are fully functioning uh, aren't worried about the past. They're not worried about the future. They appreciate what they have right now, and they're fully uh, uh, alive in the moment and uh, appreciate the things around them. The fully functioning people tend to be uh, tend to associated with uh, increases in creativity and also more intensely felt emotions. And you might think, oh, well, this is what we're striving for, intensely felt emotions, so I'm going to be much happier. And Rogers said, yes, and much sadder. Right? Because uh, for Rogers and for other humanists, uh, sadness, anger, these things aren't necessarily uh, bad. They aren't uh, negative. Society may say, oh, you shouldn't feel this way. For humanists, they say, if you feel that way, then that's how you feel. And to be truly human, truly yourself, you'll feel the full extent of your sadness and the full extent of your anger. So you'll experience these emotions uh, uh, more intensely and more fully. And because of all these things, you'll live a, a richer, uh, more fulfilling life. So we're all growing toward this uh, becoming, becoming more of a fully functioning person. Uh, and Roger's other kind of, uh, one of his other big ideas was is that the emphasis he put on, on self-concept. Right? Great, he tried to attach great importance to how individuals experience themselves. And notice I didn't, I didn't say how people uh, thought about themselves how they experience themselves, which includes how you think about yourself. How you experience yourself is more than just thoughts. Right? There's, the, there's an affective component uh, to it as well. Uh, so the way that you experience yourself is your self-concept. Uh, and we all have, uh, and it gets a bit forward here, even at, at, this kind of this un, at an unconscious level, you see yourself in a certain way. You kind of think of this as being your ego. Your ego is organized around certain principles that this is who I am. And you may or may not be fully aware what your self-concept is. But whenever you're out in the world, the world will treat you in a certain way, right? And that, in the way the world treats you, in the way you engage the world, uh, relates to your phenomenological view. The way the world treats you, and the way you experience the world, isn't always consistent with your self-concept. And if that incongruity between experience and self-concept is threatened, again, at an unconscious level, then the result is the experience of anxiety. Which, again, kind of a little similar to flow here. Uh, Roger's talking about you would deal with that anxiety via defense mechanisms, right? So mostly denial uh, and distortion. Oh, they didn't say that uh, it, it wasn't like that for uh, distortion. Distortion of the environment input, environmental input, sorry, or distortion of the self. Well, maybe I'm not really the way I, th I think I am. Maybe I am how they see me. Um, and these, uh, these defenses work, right, in terms of reducing anxiety. But they do so at the cost of, uh, uh, of taking away the authenticity of your life. You're no longer leading uh, an authentic experience of the world. It's a distorted uh, uh, life. And when you do that, you're moving away from being fully functioning. But people can function and they can work. Right? They keep the anxiety low. They're not fully functioning, but they're functioning through life. Unless that... Uh, uh, the disconnect, the gap between how we see ourselves uh, and the information we're getting from the world is too great. It overwhelms the defenses. Uh, then we experience uh, what Rogers would term disorganization. Right? So uh, at this point, uh, you experience extreme anxiety. And, and disorganization is probably how uh, some humanists would explain the more severe pathology or developing disorder. So everybody experiences some level of anxiety, but we deal with it with defenses and changes our behavior, but if it gets too great, we can get disorganization, and then our defenses fail, and we come up with these other things, possibly uh, depression, uh, panic attacks, uh, arguably schizophrenia, from one perspective. Uh, so disorganization would be associated with uh, your more severe pathology. So what about these uh, uh, incongruous experiences? Where do they come from? Well. Rogers talked about some of these incongruous, incongruent uh, uh, ex 
experience early in life uh, in terms of conditions of work. The idea being that uh, when you're young, around your parents, uh, you, if you act in a way, you demonstrate attitudes and behaviors that are pleasing to the parents, then they will be loving towards you. And whenever you demonstrate attitudes and behaviors that are not pleasing to them, they will withdraw their love. And so uh, a child learns that uh, love and esteem and worth or value are conditional. Right? Out of very, think about the, the child's mind. You know, that is, don't you? Well, no, they still love you. They're trying to teach you a lesson. But as a, for a child, think about that experience about, wow, when, when I'm bad, they're very angry and they don't love me. When I do these things, they're happy and they love me. Okay? So get that idea that they begin to think that uh, love and their own worth is conditional, conditional upon being a certain way. And so they'll deny uh, and distort aspects of themselves in order to get the love uh, in work. And the, it may even be things that you may say, well, yeah, you don't want to be that way. You know, the kid needs to not be bratty. But you think about brattiness being um, a manifestation of wanting uh, things your own way and asserting your independence and asserting your needs. You think, okay, when I assert my needs, I'm less worthwhile and I'm not lovable. So I'm going to suppress that part of myself and learn that I can't express my needs kind of see where that might develop into pathology. People who pathologically uh, deny their own needs to please others. Um, so again, the idea that uh, to deal with the anxiety, we distort ourselves to meet these conditions of work. Or not. And that, that eventually leads to leading an inauthentic life and leads to uh, ongoing problems throughout the life. Okay. Abraham Maslow. Another one of the uh, giants of the history today. Um, most well known, obviously, for uh, his hierarchy of needs. Okay. Uh, which is you know, human, human behavior was multiply influenced, but these influence could be arranged in a, in a hierarchy. And in terms of the placement on the hierarchy, hierarchy where certain needs felt, you know, with your, your physiological needs uh, down at the bottom, uh, wasn't about the importance or, or value of a motivating factor. It was to reflect the idea that those needs that are closer to the base will have greater sway, greater influence, the less they are fulfilled. And the needs higher up won't have as much motivating power until the baser, the lower needs, are more satisfied. That's where it goes. That's why there's the hierarchy. Like, okay, the degree to which you satisfy these lower ones will influence how much the higher ones will matter. Like it doesn't matter, you know. Self self actualization doesn't matter if you're starving. You're not going to try to self actualize. You're going to try to eat. So, uh, the simple story like that. Thinking about it, but then you don't want to oversimplify it because for Maslow, it wasn't uh, you know this need and then this need, or you know pick is it this need or this need that motivated behavior. It was probably multiple uh, needs uh, being met uh, in, in affecting level of motivation to act in a certain way because the needs can act uh, uh, simultaneously to motivate behavior. So all levels might be working at, well, at once. And the, the, own, the, the hierarchy still matters because the degree of influence for a particular need will depend on the degree to which lower needs are met. Right? Um, so you, but you don't need... Uh, a need doesn't have to be fully met at a lower level before some other need can have some influence. Right? So your base needs, they're not fully met. That doesn't mean that self-actualization actually isn't important at all. It's just less important. It's le it has less of an effect on behavior until lower needs are more fully met. So they can still have some influence at the same time. Um, so getting to that, that top of the pyramid, the self-actualization, this is again going to that, uh, that idea of um, personal growth. It's common to the humanist theory. Abraham Maslow talked about the personal growth being toward this process of, of self-actualization, uh, which is, again, a, a drive to be your, your true self. With the assumption, again, that the true self is, is somehow positive and creative, you know, not you know, trying to be your most evil, uh, deceitful self. But there's an assumption there that you're, you are good at your core and that that will be revealed as you move toward uh, self-actualization uh, and strip away 
the societal uh, demands that have uh, led you not to pursue your, your true self. Another one of the uh, big contributions of Maslow would be to, to focus on the positive side of psychology, which we now talk about a field of psychology, subfield uh, being called positive psychology, which um, Maslow uh, substantially influenced. <coughs> because he wanted to study psychologically healthy people. Right? He was, you know, everybody else was worried about the neurotics and the psychotics. He said, well, what about people who are fine? I want to know about, about them. Similarly, people were focusing on the unconscious. He said, okay, good, you, you, you got that part? I want to know about people, people's conscious uh, motivations. You know, what things that you're aware of uh, are guiding your behavior. So how did he study these things? Uh, there's part of the problem with Maslow. Uh, he developed a, one approach was he developed uh, a list of people that, that seemed to him to be self-actualized, uh, uh, people he knew and then also historical figures, and they looked for commonalities uh, among their personalities. Um, obviously, there's problems with this method from a scientific point of view, um, but none of, just because the, the method wasn't scientific doesn't mean the information has no value, but it certainly has limited scientific value. Um, but using this method, he came up with some uh, characteristics of self-actualized self people. Right? So these are people who uh, tend to be more accepting of themselves, uh, including their flaws, their shortcomings. So it's not like they would, uh, they're would they perfect people. They have shortcomings, but they accept them. Well, yeah, I, I'm late all the time. That's me. I'd like, to be, uh, I, uh, I'd like to be on time sometimes, but this is just how I am, and this is how I will, will likely always be. So they accept themselves. Um, they're uh, free from culture and re cultural restraints for making decisions. So again, that comes back, that comes back to that idea of personal responsibility. Because once you take responsibility for your decisions, it's not just uh, it's my responsibility. It's no, it's it's my responsibility. You don't tell me what I should do, what I shouldn't do. I determine what I will do. Not that you're trying to act in opposition to cultural uh, norms or mores or morals, but you understand that. You're not doing it because you should or they said. You're doing, you're choosing because you want to. It's an active uh, choice. Uh, people also have, uh, are more creative. Uh, so it sounds a lot like uh, Roger's idea of the fully functioning individual. Uh, but then the other piece that Maslow added is they also have, they're more, more likely to experience uh, peak experiences. So these peak experiences, uh, this is an interesting, uh, facet of, of Maslow's research, and he, he wrote a lot about them, uh, and they're in many ways uh, described as, as transcendental uh, experiences, uh, spiritual in nature uh, for some individuals. Uh, some people will talk about their, in, in the research on uh, peak experiences, talk about uh, um, feeling as if they are uh, in communion with the higher power, or at one with some universal uh, um, being, or universal oneness. For others, it's, it's about a, a moment of, of clarity. But it's, it's this experience that um, is qualitatively different from everyday life experience. And they don't stay at the peak. They have these experiences where they have this moment of clarity, this oneness, this special sense of being, and then they come back to where they were before. And the idea that these self-actualized people are able to have this experience, peak experiences, uh, uh, more often. And again, these, these uh, experiences thought to be associated with, with uh, healthy psychological function. So, Rogers and Maslow are important in, in the, the development of humanistic thought, and then uh, uh, more modern uh, uh, theorists uh, who uh, kind of step, in, step into the, the role of a more modern uh, humanist would be uh, Mihai Shusinksmi. Uh, Basically, she got me. It's not she got me. It's she chicks me. She sent me. I, sorry, that's a tough name. Um, but hopefully, hopefully, if some of you got to see him uh, a year or two ago, we can just later we talk. Interesting guy, uh, and and big in the field that's now called positive uh, psychology. Uh, Mihai talked about optimal uh, experience. And, and has done research asking people to describe moments when they were um, truly happy. Your, what's your best time? And from the kind of qualitative approach, he found these commonalities. 
identify these experiences, these optical experiences that uh, some people term flow. You experience flow. These are experiences that involve a sense of uh, high energy, intense concentration. So it's not just relaxing, feeling good. You know, you're not uh, laying out by the pool drinking your um, your Cuba Libra or whatever. Oh, I'm really happy. No, this is uh, when you're doing something uh, you love. Usually, and it could be uh, uh, riding, could be climbing a mountain, uh, running a marathon, um, painting, uh, mowing the lawn, whatever. But you're doing something, and there's some challenge in it, and you get lost in, in the in the moment where you kind of lose a sense of, uh, of time, or maybe even place. Where people, somebody, you know, tapped you, so you, you startled out of your your reverie. But that um, these are the experiences that uh, we want to strive for and that make life uh, worthwhile. And so he's done research looking at how people can uh, experience these, these optimal experiences, these, these uh, senses of, of flow. And uh, contrary to the opinion of some, more likely to have these uh, optimal experiences uh, in the workplace than when at play. Uh, because they're to get the optimal experience, there has to be some challenge. And some people choose play experiences that involve challenge, like marathoners are a good example of that. But if you're like myself, you sit on the couch and watch TV, which doesn't involve much challenge. Um, and we think of work often as being, you know, oh, the drudgery, and oh, I don't want to do it, it's so boring. It all depends on your uh, approach. Thinking back to stuff we looked at before, someone with a mastery goal right, versus a performance goal is more likely to have an uh, optimal experience, more likely to experience flow. If you go in uh, with the idea of, I want to get better at this and, and see the best that I can do, then you've got a chance of getting these, these experiences of flow. If you go and say, oh, I want to see if I can get the high score, probably not going to get that, uh, that experience. It's a, a, a lot of it's about the approach. Uh, and related to that, uh, Mihai argue, argues that um, you can get these experiences uh, in everyday life. In, in anything you're doing, mowing the lawn, playing with kids, uh, whatever. The, the, the important thing is uh, taking responsibility for finding happiness and meaning in your life. Finding the things that you find uh, meaningful and relevant, relevant and fulfilling. And then engaging in them fully. Being in the here and now with them, not just going through the motions uh, of the routine that you're maybe supposed to follow or used to follow. But really be in there in that moment. And you can get these optimal experiences, which he felt were, again, related to healthy psychological function. In terms of uh, applications of uh, human history theory, uh, the main one, from my point of view as a, as a therapist, the most important one would be um, you know, Roger's development of, of person-centered, uh, person-centered or client-centered therapy. Uh, a couple things about this approach to therapy. One, the client uh, is the expert on the client, okay? which goes back to the idea of the individual phenomenology. Because uh, there's an assumption here that the client knows herself, himself better than you ever could. Right? Whereas uh, for Freud, you say, well, the client can't know him or herself because it's all unconscious, and I've got to sift through this unconscious and find the things that's the expert. In many ways, person said it was a reaction that they no, no, no the person has access to all their conscious and all their unconscious. They know themselves, and all, you have, all your job as the therapist is to help them see themselves, be a reflection for them to gain uh, understanding and insight, because they're the ones that, that hold the keys. Related to that, they're responsible for change. Right? So you're not going in as a therapist to, to fix someone, to cure someone. You're going in as, a, as an accomplice as an aid uh, to help them in their endeavor to change, to, to experience growth. You're not going to grow them, but you're there to, to help them grow, but they have to do it. Okay? And that makes uh, a world of difference from the client perspective and from the therapist uh, perspective. So they're the expert, they're responsible for change, and what the therapist uh, does is provide uh, an environment that supports change and growth. So that environment involves uh, three, three key ingredients. One, uh, unconditional positive regard. Um, so this is the idea uh, related to kind of acceptance, where 
whatever they tell you, you're going to uh, give them this unconditional positive attention. It's not like, okay, I'm going to uh, like you and talk to you if you talk about these things, but if you say, talk about this, uh, I can't handle that, I'm not going to uh, be around you. And it doesn't mean you have to sanction things. So if you're working with somebody uh, who says, uh, yeah, I get really angry and, and I hit my wife, you don't have to say, yeah, I can see how you would want to do that, she probably deserves it. Right? You don't have to say, yeah, that's good. You say, well, that's, that's really, uh, that's an unacceptable behavior. That, that's, but the unconditional positive regard part of it is that I know you as a person want to be uh, a better uh, husband. I know you don't want to hurt anybody. I know it's got to be tearing you up inside that uh, that you did this. So I don't hate you. I don't uh, devalue you as a person because of your behaviors. Your worth is not related to your actions. Which is a really foreign idea for a lot of people. Uh, both in terms of uh, but, you know, if I've done these bad things, I'm a bad person. And on the other end, but I'm a good person. I've done all these good things. Uh, in, in humanist, which in some ways mirrors uh, some uh, spiritual beliefs, or, uh, organized religious beliefs, that your actions are irrelevant in terms of your worth. You have an innate worth that you cannot diminish or augment by what you do. And that's what the therapist has unconditional positive regard for, is that worth. Not for your actions, but your worth is always going to be valued, regardless of what you do, and it cannot be negated. Um, in doing that, one of the main uh, things you do is uh, providing empathy, and empathy is not the same thing as sympathy. And sympathy is, oh, I feel really bad for you. That, that's got to suck. Empathy is actively trying to understand how they're feeling, and not uh, not just that, because I mean, in some ways, that's the definition of empathy. I understand what you're saying. But therapeutically, uh, and for uh, persons in therapy, empathy involves an active trying to understand and communicating that you're trying to understand. And it's not so much that you have to understand exactly, but you have to try and you have to communicate the effort. And that's what seems to uh, uh, matter to people, that you're trying to understand them and trying to uh, feel what they feel. Uh, but at the same time, recognize that you can never fully understand or feel what they're feeling. But you, you, you wouldn't hear a humanistic therapist saying, uh, um, I know exactly how you feel. You'll never hear a humanistic therapist uh, uh, say that. Because, again, we go back to that individual phenomenology. I can never know how you feel. I can only imagine how horrible that must be. Or I can only imagine how happy your, your joy must have been when you heard that. You know, so it's not all negative. Positive, too. Trying to, uh, I'm trying to communicate, to communicate to you that I am, with all my present awareness, trying to understand your feeling and your experiences. And that's a unique experience for people. You don't get that a lot. And it can be uh, a transformative experience for people. And then the, the third uh, and final component of person centered therapy would be genuineness uh, on the part of the therapist. Uh, so not um, uh, playing the role of the therapist. Uh, not sitting there going, mm-hmm, yeah, I see. Mm. Being a genuine person in that room, right? which there's a tendency um, for a lot of help givers to adopt a, a role and play a role to a certain extent because it's protected. Because especially if you're dam if you're dealing with damaged people, you you may be afraid of being damaged yourself by them. And so I'm not going to be my real self in this in, in this room with this person because I might get hurt. So I'm going to play this role of this helpful, caring person. So I really am helpful and caring, but I'm not going to be my full self. To do personal therapy, you have to be your genuine self, which means if they do something that uh, uh, angers you, talking about it. Well, but you have to have positive regard. Yeah, you do. And you have to be genuine. And that's where these things, uh, you can see the, the, the difficulty. This isn't as maybe as simple as it first sounds. If, you're th if the client angers you, you have to communicate your anger while still accepting their value as a person. I didn't say, wow, when you said that, I really felt uh, you know, my stomach tightened. And uh, I, uh, I could feel my fists clenching. And when you use that word to describe that group of people, uh, it really, it really bothered me. And I just have to share that with you. So that's being genuine, having kind of the courage to, to self-disclose uh, those reactions appropriately. Uh, it's an important part of a person's therapy, person-centered therapy. 
the idea being that people then who experience this, they experience someone who's with them, being a, a real person, a real person who's interested in how I'm feeling and trying actively to understand me. And then giving me this unconditional acceptance where no matter what horrible things I say or what wonderful things I say about myself, their, their core feeling and attitude toward me stays the same and it's positive. Imagine that, that, that could potentially be a powerful experience. So that's one of the important outgrowths of the humanistic uh, approach. In terms of uh, evaluating the approach, obviously it has an intuitive appeal for many people. Especially when you, if after reading uh, psychodynamic stuff or reading a lot of behavior stuff, you might have the same reaction that the other humanists felt. Like, eh, that makes me feel kind of icky about people. You know, I don't want to think about people having just being uh, wanting sex and aggression or being like these uh, lab rats who will do anything uh, uh, for for a block of cheese. There's something very appealing about an approach that that places such emphasis on free will and um, making your own choices. Um, another kind of uh, strength of the approach is its uh, ability to talk about uh, healthy function. Like many of the approaches to personality uh, that grow out of uh, therapeutic approaches uh, are more concerned with uh, pathology and when things aren't going well. And they don't have as much to say about, well, what are people who are generally happy and well adjusted? Why are they that way? You know, other than saying, well, they don't have these problems, that's why they're fine. Well, but how do you get to be fine? How do you get to be well adjusted? And the humanistic approach has a bit more to say about uh, happiness and fulfillment and creativity and self-actualization with optimal experience. So there's more more there on, on that side. Um, there are concerns about the uh, empirical uh, validation uh, of the theory, largely because the, many of the concepts, uh, like those in uh, psychodynamic theory, aren't well defined. Or what do you mean exactly uh, by self-actualization? You know, in, in the theories themselves use slightly different terms for things that seem to be the same thing, which adds to the, the, the confusion, uh, which makes it harder to, to study in advance the, the, the scientific knowledge uh, read in the theory. Uh, so some of the, the concepts themselves don't lend themselves very well uh, to empirical examination. How do you study free will? When somebody uh, does something and you can't... Uh, see a clear determinant of the behavior. I can't see any reward or consequence that influences that. I can't figure out any impulse. I don't know why this happened. Well, it must be free will. Yeah. And if you have that kind of logical rule out, well, if it's not anything, it must be this. That's not empirical. Right? It has to be uh, observable. Um, which doesn't mean free will doesn't exist. It just means that it doesn't lend itself to empirical uh, study. So uh, some of the, the, the research related to the humanistic approach less sound, uh, less strong data uh, than with other other theories, some of the theories, largely because of the, the quality of the theory, not so much anything else. Uh, the other thing, kind of the opposite of the healthy functioning, one of the criticism, criticisms uh, of the uh, approach is that it uh, is limited in its understanding of the more severe pathologies, and that it makes sense for all the kind of daily problems of living, this makes sense, but somebody who's profoundly disturbed, this doesn't, doesn't fit. And I think there's uh, some credence to that, uh, but at the same time, there are those instances, instances where uh, using the principles of humanistic uh, theory, working with really disturbed individuals, you can see some profound changes. And uh, from a humanistic point of view, severe pathology is related to severe disruptions uh, uh, of the self-concept in really kind of pathological environments and place where somebody's self-concept was severely threatened by uh, input, by negative events. And you can think of uh, these more severe pathologies being what happens whenever the regular defense mechanisms uh, break down and the personality becomes disorganized. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I think the, the, the criticism is somewhat valid in terms of the humanistic approach does a better job of explaining those everyday problems of living than they do this kind of severe pathology. Okay, uh, that's it for now. Take care.